hello and welcome to another video on basic fiber optics. Today I will explain how OTDR, or specifically phase OTDR, works. The idea is that we'll generate some pulses using the same setup utilized for the video on electro-optical modulators. These pulses will be amplified and filtered and then sent into a long fiber. The idea is that as the pulse travels into the fiber, back reflection will um, cause a light signal that's continuous to be sent back through the fiber into the circulator and through port number three to a photodiode where it can be recorded using the oscilloscope. And then if there's any changes to the fiber throughout here, that'll cause a phase change in the, the light, which can be observed as a change in the interference pattern created here in the oscilloscope. Now, just to be clear, this fiber I'm going to use for this particular experiment um, consists of a large number of distributed fiber rack gratings, which we discussed in an earlier video. You can also do this whole technique using just an ordinary single mode fiber, but then you need an amplifier and another filter right here. So for simplicity, I've decided to cheat a little bit and use this um, fiber with distributed fiber rack gratings to get a higher reflection coefficient and then avoid the necessity for another fiber, another uh, filter right here. Also, I'm going to place a mirror at the end of this fiber so we should be able to see a very sharp spike that can uh, help us identify when we've reached the, the end of the spool. So the first step we actually have to do is to make sure that the wavelength of the laser is aligned with the central wavelength of this filter as well as the central reflection uh, wavelength of these FPGs here. So that's the first step. Okay, so now we're ready to align the laser wavelength to the central wavelength of the fiber crack gratings inscribed in the fiber spool. So the yellow trace here, the little bump, that is the reflection spectrum of the um, fiber spool that I've measured in advance. Now I'm going to turn on the laser, like so. It looks like we have to increase the wavelength a little bit. So each of these ticks here is 0 0.5 nanometers. So let us increase this a little bit. Like so. That was maybe a little bit too much. It's still adjusting. So luckily the, um, the software controlling the laser inside of the uh, the device that we used in the EOM video. Um, you can simply tune the, the wavelength using the software, which is quite convenient. I think it need, needs to be a little bit smaller to be central. So I'm just going to adjust it. That's pretty good, but I think we can do a little bit better. see okay that is pretty close good so now the laser is aligned to the central wavelength of the, the grating so let's try and adjust the uh, filter after the EDFA so that it's also aligned with, with this location here stay tuned for that okay now I've connected an EDFA to the filter we're using and connected the output of that filter directly to the optical spectrum analyzer and so I should be able to tune the wavelength here and align it with both the grading as well as the data we're using. As you can see right now, we have quite a broad bandwidth, so I'm going to use the tuning functionality of the filter to reduce it a bit more. There we go. I think we can go a bit further. Okay, that is starting to look pretty good. So maybe just increase the wavelength slightly. And there we go. So now all the filters are aligned and we can actually set up everything so we can do phase OTDR. Okay, so before we get started with actually showing the phase OTDR trace, I just want to share a quick technique for um, estimating the peak power of the pulses you're using. So right now we're using 10 nanosecond pulses and the period this pulse signal is one microsecond or essentially 100 times larger than the pulse width. Now the power meter right here is measuring basically zero dBm. That's the average power measured over um, essentially one microsecond. But of course since the actual pulse is only on for one one hundredth of that time we know that the real uh, sort of peak power of the pulse is actually going to be 100 times larger than this number here. In other words it should be 20 dBm. So that's around 100 milliwatts of power we have inside of the, the pulse right now. So that's what we're sending into this 
spool here containing the inscribed fiber rack ratings, and hopefully we can see a very nice trace coming out of it. All right, just one final trick before we, we see the actual trace. I decided to uh, plug the output of the filter directly into the um, optical spectrum analyzer now that the pulses are on. And as you can see, the filter wasn't completely in the center here, so we can actually do slightly better by doing like so, and then reducing the bandwidth just a bit more. There we go, so that should remove just a little bit more of the noise. Now, I'm not sure it's going to have a huge impact since the amount of noise out here is like very small compared to the peak power of the pulse, but in any case, that's another trick you can use in order to get the sort of optimal signal, is to look at the final signal you want, plug it into the optical spectrum analyzer, and then sort of gradually align all of the fields in between until you maximize this peak power here. Anyway, let's actually see that trace. Okay, actually, just one more thing before we, we see the trace. So, when you have to work with the fiber optic setup, you often need to shut off the power. So of course there's different ways we can do that. We could shut off the power here in the, the back and all the way throughout the, the setup, but actually it usually suffices to just turn off the amplifier that's closest to the place you want to modify the setup. So right now this amplifier is the most recent thing that's in the setup, so I'm just going to turn that off. And essentially this is now going to work as a, as a shutter that just blocks all of the light coming in, like nothing's going to come out right now that this is, uh, this is shut off. All right, so just a moment, we'll see the, the cool trace, I promise. Okay, here we actually see the uh, signal we're getting at the photodiode from the uh, reflection inside the, the fiber. As you can see right now, it's just a big mess, and I suspect what's happening here, if you zoom in, you should be able to see these individual spikes here and a bunch of noise. So I think what's happening is that right now, we actually have a repetition rate that's too short compared to the length of the fiber. So multiple consecutive traces are actually overlapping. So let me try and change the rotation rate to maybe 10 microseconds. Okay, that seems a little bit better. You can see these nice large spikes here. Those are probably from the end mirror. Let's try with 100 microseconds. Okay, it's a bit better. And yeah, now I think we can see the traces created by individual, individual pulses. Let me move the camera around a bit. Okay, so let's try and zoom in and see what what's going on here. So what you'll notice is that I've actually turned the um, turned averaging on up here, so it's going to average 16 consecutive traces and overlap them. So that should give us a slightly more stable output that doesn't oscillate as much. Okay, so what we're seeing here is actually the, the phase OTDR trace from inside the fiber. So the idea is that we have a pulse that's coming into the fiber, and then every single um, segment of the fiber, one of the um, waves that overlap that segment are going to send light backwards, and then we get an interference pattern here at the, um, at the input. Now, one thing you notice is that it has a bunch of uh, sort of spikes here, and essentially, we can uh, think about what the resolution of this setup here is, because obviously if you have a very narrow, short pulse, then it's only pulses or only light from a very small fiber segment that actually contributes to any given part of this interference pattern. Right now it's 10 nanoseconds, so if I increase that to, let's say, 50 nanoseconds, let's see what happens here. So you can see that first of all we have a bit more power because now we have sort of more waves contributing to the same interference pattern because the pulse is longer. And you can also see that each one of these sort of major spikes here is now longer in duration. So we've sort of increased the, uh, the strength here at the cost of um, lower resolution. So let's see what happens if we increase this to 100 nanoseconds. There you go. So you can see that now it's actually completely overlapping. And I think we can even see the photodiode saturating up here because we've got just got this, uh, this flat uh, flat behavior right here. So I think that's because the photodiode can only take so much light before it just, you know, you can't really give any more signal beyond that, so it just gives a flat, flat surface. So let's maybe reduce the pulse duration down to 10 nanoseconds, like so again. All right. So as we can see, we uh, have this sort of exponentially decreasing strength of the pulse. You can sort of see this exponential behavior right here. So essentially what we have is some kind of interference pattern that's sort of multiplied by a um, a decreased exponential, because you can sort of imagine that every time the pulse propagates through a segment of the fiber, then some percentage of the light gets either lost or scattered backwards. And then if you have a continuous um, number of multiplications all added onto each other, then you essentially get exponential behavior. Maybe we can zoom in a bit more to the end point of the fiber here and see if there's something interesting going on there. So we can change this, so it's going to be a bit. Yeah, okay, that's kind of just saturated. Actually, just to um, sort of indicate how we might detect a, um, a cut or a fault or a lot of bending loss in a fiber, let me try and actually take 
the, uh, the mirror at the end of the fiber and then just bend the fiber before as we've seen before. So I'm going to bend the fiber. You might be able to see the reflection of the oscilloscope screen here. Yeah, so you can see. So imagine that we're monitoring some kind of fiber optic network and we see that all of a sudden we uh, have a drop in the reflection here. Well, then we know that certainly some kind of bending loss or a problem has occurred before that point. There we go. Let's see what else we can uh, get up to here. I want to see if we can actually get the trace to change as a response to um, an external perturbation. So maybe I'll try and put my hand on the beginning of the fiber spool here, see if I can get it to respond slightly. Uh, it's a bit hard to see. I don't think I really have enough heating power on my hand. Maybe I'll just try and put my finger directly on it, see what happens. Getting any kind of change. Uh, kind of. Yeah, I think we actually are. If you observe this segment right down here, let me take a look a little bit closer. So I'm going to put my finger on now. And now I'm going to remove my finger now. And put it back on. And remove it. So you can kind of see that right here. There's some kind of behavior going on. So put my finger on now and remove it and put it on and remove it. So what's happening here is that I'm um, applying a little bit of a temperature change to a particular segment of the fiber, which means that all of the little scattering centers that inside of that segment will experience like different phase shifts because of that change, which means that they'll interfere slightly differently, which means that we get a, an alteration in the interference pattern that we're, we're seeing here. So essentially that's how you would do what's called fiber optic sensing in order to measure, let's say, temperature changes all the way throughout the whole length of, um, of a fiber. This particular method, um, it's nice for, for measuring the presence of a change, but it doesn't really show us exactly how big that temperature change is, and that's actually a bit difficult to do for this particular sensing scheme. But there's other methods where you send in more sophisticated pulses or have these clever demodulation schemes that will tell you exactly what the, the temperature change was. Okay, so I hope that's uh, an interesting introduction to phase 2 TDR. Stay tuned for more videos.